Hello again, it's Olya, and thank you for coming back. In my previous video, I went over the basic formula, the basic profit formula, sorry, <laughs> for a fix and flip. In today's video, I want to talk about the most crucial component of that formula, your after repair value, ARV, as I will refer to it from now on, how to find it and why it's so important. And look, I'll be honest here, my favorite part of any fix and flip is the beginning and the end. Doing that very first weird walk through a dumpy house, imagining what it will be like all finished up and gorgeous is really fun for me. I love seeing the vision through the mess. And then doing that very first open house, which I get to do myself as I am my own realtor, that's really fun too. When everything is uh, freshly painted and sparkles and smells good and I'm all dressed up listening to people say how gorgeous it is. They don't know it was me who did it. So that's really fun. I know it's a little vain. I don't care. Figuring this out, running the numbers a million times, I hate it. I also don't love that in between noisy, dusty stage of the actual renovation. I don't do any of that myself and I'm very fortunate. I have a wonderful team for that, but no matter how good your team is, I promise you, you will still run into problems. You can have bad weather that causes delays. You can have neighbors complaining about the noise, which can result in um, city inspector visits, usually surprise city inspector visits. You can have endless runs to hardware stores. All of that, do I love it? No, I don't, not at all. And I must add, if you ever hear anyone say that this entire process is fun or that it's easy, run. They're full of it. I promise you they are. Mm -hmm. Now that I have gotten that out of my system, <laughs> why is ARV so important? At least two reasons. And let me backtrack a little bit. I have mentioned this in my previous video, but I will say it again, because it is so important to understand. When you're flipping a house, you make money when you buy, not when you sell. Of course, you get your actual paycheck from when you sell the house, but where does the profit come from? If you are investing and not gambling, you must buy low enough and account for all of the risks. And you know right away, as soon as you buy it, that you will make money. And if you're really good, you should have a close range on exactly how much you will make. On the other hand, if you buy something and you don't know the ARV, and you're just hoping that the project will be worth more fixed up, you're throwing darts in the dark. Will it be worth more? Most likely, yes. Will it be worth so much more that it will cover all of the project costs and make you money? That you can't know if you don't know your ARV. So in order to buy well, you must learn how to calculate the ARV correctly. Reason number one is that you don't want to compromise your profit by overpaying for property in the beginning. And reason number two is that you don't want to miss out on a good deal because you didn't understand its true value. The first property I ever bought was a wonderful example of how people can walk past something that has huge potential and not even know it. It was a listed property too, which means it was on all of the websites that you can think of when you go look for available homes. And I must add, it was during a very, very hot and fast market. The Seattle area has been booming for a while, but that year it was especially fast and everyone was looking for deals, myself included. Now, I had told everyone that I was looking for a property to flip. I think it's very important to let people know what you're doing, especially in the beginning. 
as you may never know where that first deal comes from. A coworker at the company I used to work at found this deal on MLS and told me about it. We ran the numbers on it together and it was clear that there was profit to be made. I bought it and in less than three months, I made a 44% return on my investment. So see, this property was in plain sight and no one took notice. So I will stress again how crucial it is to learn to run the numbers correctly, no matter how tedious it can get. And trust me, it can get very, very tedious. So here it is, the boring technical part. I'll be looking down for this a little bit. Sorry, I just don't remember all of this by heart. So I need to look at my little uh, cheat sheet. Number one, number one thing that you need are three to five souls in the area. And by souls, I mean properties that have already been sold. Don't look at anything that's pending or active. A lot of times uh, listing price is seller's wishful thinking and it doesn't mean that it's going to get sold for that amount. So look at uh, properties that have already been sold. Number two is you need to know when they were sold. Ideally, um, you want to look at three to six months. Sometimes the market can be super, super fast and prices are going up by the minute it feels like. So in that case, six months might be a little too old, but usually three to six months is fine. Um, in later videos, I will go into more detail on comparable sales and how to analyze it uh, because I can talk about that for probably three hours. <laughs> but for today, let's keep it simple. Number three is those comparable sales need to be within half a mile to a mile radius. Number four, same number of bedrooms and bathrooms, ideally. Number five is they have to have similar square footage or as close as possible, um, especially when you're looking at more expensive homes. And here in Seattle area, everything feels like more expensive home because our you know, starter homes are about $700,000 here. So obviously if you're looking at a home um, that's at that price range, 200 square feet can make a huge difference. Number six is style of home must be the same. If you are looking to renovate a town home, you have to look at other town homes. If you're looking to renovate um, a manufactured home, you have to compare it with other manufactured homes. Whatever style of home you're looking at, your comparable sales need to be the same style. Also, school district is very important. Sometimes, depending on the school's rating, you cannot compare two homes that are similar otherwise because the ratings of school districts are different. So number seven is the age of your home. Let's say you're looking at a property to buy and flip that was built in 2001. You can't compare, you can't have a comparable sold that was built in 1900s. That doesn't work. Um, and usually newer homes will be worth more. As beautiful as those old homes can be, they can also be full of surprises that nobody wants to see. Let's say you're looking at a property that was built in 2000. I wouldn't want to see more than 10, 15 years on either side of that for your comparable sales. Um, number eight, something that no one ever talks about, but I call it comfort and convenience factor. Let's say you have a house that has uh, two full baths, right? Three bedroom, two bathroom house, for example. You can compare it to a house that has one full bathroom and one shower, but you cannot compare it to a house that has one full bathroom and another half bath. Half bath means you just have a toilet and a sink, that's it. Why? Well, because let's say you have two full baths and another, uh, sorry, a full, two full baths and one full bath in the shower. Well, you can still shower, obviously, in the shower. You cannot shower in a half bath. Most people don't really take baths anymore and it's not what's important. The most important thing is you can shower in a bathroom. So 
let's say you have in-laws visiting and everyone has to shower in your bathroom, well, that's not very convenient or comfortable. Also, if you're looking at a townhome, for example, which are usually three levels, uh, you'll have your first level uh, with like an office. Your second level is usually your living room and a kitchen. And then third level are the bedrooms. Well, if your living room and kitchen is on the first floor, that's not usually as attractive as a living room and kitchen on the second floor. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So just think like if you're looking at two properties, um, think how comfortable would, be, would it be to live there? And if something doesn't match, that's something to keep in mind. Number nine are unique factors. Um, I'll use Seattle as an example. Anyone who's ever been here or who lives here knows that we have a massive problem with traffic. There's so many cars, it's insane. I, you can be stuck for hours. So the city is building um, a light rail. I have no idea when it's gonna be finished, hopefully sometime this century, but we already know where those light rail stations are going to be. So if you're looking at a property that's near that, well, that's very attractive. However, you knowing that is not enough, right? You have to make sure that whoever you hire as a listing agent knows and understands that and understands how to sell it when they speak to your potential um, buyers. So that's it. You now more, you now know more than most realtors. <laughs> oh, two things that I would advise to not do. Number one. Um, don't use Zillow or Redfin comps because they are um, based on algorithm. They're not looking at different factors like I did here. Also, uh, the second thing to not do, and this is a sad one, is I wish I could say that all realtors know how to do this. They don't. I recently spent about a week negotiating a price down because the listing agent didn't understand and truly didn't understand why the home she was selling was completely overpriced. She had used different comps. She didn't look at the comfort and convenience uh, factor. The bathrooms were off. Uh, lots of things were off actually. And um, we ended up getting a home for about, I wanna say 40, no, about $30,000 less. So imagine being on the other side of this. Imagine you bought a house and you renovated thinking it will be $30,000 more and then it's not. So it's scary. So you really need to understand this because you don't want to be on the, on the other side of this. At the end of the day, we did get the price that we wanted and her clients were incredibly upset and so was she. Was it the client's fault? No. Was it her fault? Kind of no. She just didn't know this. Um, it's very strange. Like I said, I have my own, I'm my own realtor, but the course that you have to take is kind of weird because they don't teach this stuff. So unless the realtor is experienced prior or um, they, they learn comps at their brokerage, was, which most really don't, they, most of them don't really understand this. So yeah, there you have it. Use it. If you run your ARV analysis through this nine part filter, you should be able to get an accurate number on how much your ARV is. As always, I hope you found this video useful. I wish I could say enjoyed making it. I didn't. As I said in the beginning, number crunching is definitely not where my passion lies in this. But unfortunately, you can't avoid it. Torture or not, you have to do it every time if you want to create successful projects. In my next video, I will cover the neighborhood analysis and how to pick the best area that fits your needs, especially if you're considering doing your first project. Again, my name is Olya. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.